in mind. Um, we love our people here and we pray for them. So uh, continue to do that and we're thankful for that. Um, as you can tell, uh, Todd Frederico is not here today. Uh, he is on vacation. Uh, he is visiting uh, a different church to uh, see how they do things and how, uh, well, see how they do things and how we can be better. Um, so it's really great that Todd gets a vacation day that he gets to spend not working but working. <laughs> so, um, but we do have a special guest today. We have Mr. Chris Darling. Uh, Chris comes to us from New Tribes, uh, sorry, Ethnos 360, who used to be uh, the uh, New Tribes Bible Institute, but they're now Ethnos 360. Um, he's been there for about 20 years. In his 20 years there, um, he is, uh, his ministry focuses on the student evangelism program. Um, I have it on good authority that he is a favorite among many students that are there. And uh, Todd speaks very, very highly of you, and you're one of his favorites. You guys used to be neighbors is what I hear. Um, one of my favorite things, when Todd was my neighbor, well, he is my neighbor right now. He lives across the way. Um, he likes to spy on me when he's using the bathroom. He's in the window there. <laughs> well, it's a little weird. It's a little weird. I won't lie. No, I understand. That's good. Yeah, it's, it, 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 Todd's a good guy. Yeah. He likes to, uh, he, also, in the, when he's washing his hands in the kitchen, uh, he's looking right in my house. So I'm sure you guys have some great stories you can possibly share with us, or not. I understand. Um, but you and, you and Todd have worked on several projects together, but he speaks very, very highly of you. And we're excited to have you here uh, and preach at our church today. So, Chris, why don't you come on up? Let's give Chris a hand. All right. All right, where do I need to talk from? Is uh, this okay? Wherever you want. All right. You stand in the middle of the want. Well, look at this. <laughs> uh, so let's see. Yeah, Todd was a neighbor, uh, was our neighbor for a number of years. And um, he just has been such an influence in my life and just such an encourager to me. And I, I think um, in, in many ways he's kept me in ministry. He, an encouragement to me. I, I told you guys this. I'm, uh, I was able to be here in uh, November, and I'm glad to be back with you guys. Uh, I told you guys some of the same stories, and I, I don't mean to rehearse some of those things, but I, Todd was the guy that would talk me off of the ledge when I was thinking, ah, oh, this is just not working out. And Todd was uh, such a great friend to me, and it's still such an encouragement to me. I just really enjoyed being with him. Uh, I could tell you the story of when he shot a squirrel in the park and put it in a black plastic bag and left it under my desk and I came back from work and there's something warm and squishy in the bag. I don't know what that is. I could tell you the story of him emptying one of those big water guns into my back while I'm in chapel, doing my chapel thing. All of a sudden people are looking back and they're seeing Todd move behind the drums or whatever it is and then Super soakers. Huh? Yeah, one of the super soakers, yeah. So, yeah, Todd's been a great guy. And I, I um, was very excited that you guys uh, decided to call him to be the pastor here. I think he's going to be uh, a great pastor wherever he's at. And I was um, so looking forward to him being um, in, in the pastor somewhere. I'm really glad he, he got in here. I am so glad that he's here in Jackson. I get a chance to interact with him still sometimes. I enjoy that. Uh, however, um, I didn't exactly know uh, when, when Pastor Todd asked me to come and speak today. I didn't realize that it was New Year's. Um, he just said, hey, can you come and speak for an hour and a half at our church on Sunday morning? <laughs> 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 right, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. An hour and a half. Uh, he said, come. And then I realized, well, it's New Year's. And New Year's for like in the, the church calendar. That's like you've got to do a, a New Year's message, right? And I was like, I hate New Year's. I don't like New Year's. <laughs> I love the Christmas season. I love Thanksgiving to Christmas. I even, I'm sorry, but I even like the snow and the cold. Maybe because I don't have a driveway to plow and my commute is like a one-minute walk to my office. <laughs> but I, I love this weather. If it's going to be winter, I want it to be winter. And, and I'm, I, I'm all for this. But then after we get Christmas done... I get pretty blue sometimes, and um, and just New Year's after that just seems like, oh, it's just such a selfish holiday, and I don't like it at all. I don't, I don't want to stay up till midnight. Boy, I'm sounding like, God, oh, <laughs> <laughs> like or something. I want to go to bed. I want to, I don't want my kids to, let's wait, stay up and watch a movie, Daddy. No, let's go to bed at 1030. Yeah. So you guys go to bed. I want to watch a movie. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I was thinking, well, if you're speaking on, uh, on New Year's Eve, you've got to speak some kind of a, a change message, some kind of new message. And so I finally settled on 2 Peter chapter 1. So if you want to open up your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 1, we're going to look at 12 through 15. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 12 through 15. Because uh, even though 
it's not really something new happening tomorrow. We add one to our calendar, make it 2018, no big deal. Nothing really changes, and all of a sudden, I shun everything that happened before. Now I'm reborn and new, and nothing really happens. We had a six-year-old, uh, a, a friend of ours that just turned six recently, and his mom found him uh, looking in the mirror crying. And what's wrong, honey? I'm not taller. Yeah, it doesn't happen like that. I'm sorry, Zach. You don't all of a sudden happen something new. January 1st, 2018, is all of a sudden something's not going to happen new. But we, we, we mentally think it is. We think we're shedding the old and putting on something new. And I think that the book of Second Peter as a whole is doing that similar type of thing. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 12 through 15. How about I, I'm going to go ahead and pray before that. Hey, I really enjoyed those singing, that singing. That was really fun for me. Um, you know, maybe just being at the front of a church and, and hearing you guys not sing to me, but sing towards me, and I hear all your voices blended together. I think that's going to be uh, maybe in heaven when we hear all the voices blending together, not just the baritones and the basses and the treble. What are the other ones? I'm not a... Soprano, also soprano. I'm not a music guy, but I wonder if maybe some of the language, the, the French people come in, and then speak, people speaking German and Swahili, and the, the English speakers, and I wonder if that's going to be that, that that great harmony that God says, yes, beautiful. I don't know, but I really love that singing. That was good, some good songs, good truth in those songs, and you guys sang very well. I enjoyed that thing a lot. I'm going to go ahead and start with prayer, though. Okay, Father, we love you. We thank you for the opportunity to. Um, to sing to you, to praise you. We thank you that you have revealed yourself to us and revealed so many things about yourself so that we can praise you. We can praise you as being that omnipotent God, that omnisapient God, that all-wise God, that all-knowing God, that all-present God. We thank you for revealing yourself in all these ways, but also being our Father that wants to relate to us on that level, not like our earthly fathers have done in so many ways, but um, that, that, that ultimate, that perfect, that, that, that good and a gracious and loving Father. Thank you for revealing truth to us. And as we open up um, the book of Second Peter this morning, I pray that you would continue to communicate with us, continue to change our thinking, renew our minds, so that me, my brothers and sisters here, Father God, and all around the city and the state and the world, uh, believers of the gathering, would, uh, would praise you more as a result of the truth that we see this morning. Thank you that you are a powerful God and that you work through your word and that you work through your people. And I pray that we'd be encouraging each other today. Thank you for your love. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, so 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 12 through 15. I'm going to break into a little bit of context. I think there's a, a context break between 1 through 11 and then 12 through 21. But chapter, 12, or chapter 1, verse 12 opens up with this. Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. I think it right, as long as I am in this body, to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me, and I'll make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able to, at any time, to recall these things. So there's a couple of big ideas in there that Peter repeats over and over again, which I think is very interesting. The book of 2 Peter... Um, was the, the most hotly debated book when they were thinking, okay, what are the books of the Bible that we think really are inspired by the apostles, inspired by God, and written by the apostles? In the early centuries of the church, Second Peter had a hard time getting into it because Second Peter sounds so very different than First Peter. And Second Peter has a number of unique words, the most concentration of words that are used only once in the, in the scriptures. And yet Peter also has cert certain words that he repeats over and over again. I think that's just fascinating. And right here in 1, 12 through 15, we've got three words that he's going to repeat three different times in here. One word that's going to repeat three times, but you don't think he's say that over. Uh, we've got some ideas that he repeats over and over again. And, um, and he's going to continue that theme that he actually started in, in, in 1 Peter, but he's going to continue on that into uh, 2 Peter. But did you catch some of those ideas, some of those words? There's a step behind me. That would be bad if I fell over. You guys wouldn't tell Todd this, would you? He fell over. I can't help it. Was he drunk that night? Uh, you're on video. Right. Anyway, chapter 1, 12 through 15. What are some of those repeated ideas? Did you catch some of those? Reminding. Reminding. Remembering. That big idea, yeah. He's got that in there three times. Chapter uh, 3. Verses 1 and 2, he's got that in there a couple more times there. That's a big idea for Peter. 
Tell me something else you saw in there that was kind of a repeated idea. Anybody see anything about his death? Yeah, stuff he says about his death. Uh, talks about reminding, talks about dying. Uh, he also talks about being diligent. That's another of, of Peter's repeated ideas that he uses in this epistle, being diligent. And, he re- and it's, it's as if he's on his deathbed, not that he's going to die of cancer or die of being mauled by a gladiator gone amok or anything, but he realizes he's going to be put to death by, 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 uh, by Nero. History tells us he was crucified upside down by Nero. Probably the Apostle Paul had already been beheaded by Nero. And so Paul is gone off the scene. Peter realizes, you know what? My time is numbered. I'm going to be dead here in a few days, a couple months. I don't know. So he's on his deathbed. And it's like, what do I want to tell the church? Something new is coming for Peter. Something new is coming for the church. Uh, a church that's that's outside of the influence of Peter, the apostle, Paul, the apostle. And so what's going to happen with this new thing? <clears throat> As an aside, I want to say a couple things he says about, uh, about death and dying. The word he uses for, for death there in verse 15, he says, After my departure, I was reading EFB, I think. After my departure, the word departure there in Greek is exodus. Have you heard that word before? Mm-hmm. Of course you have, right? We all know the Exodus. The Exodus is like reaches way back, you know, 1,500, 2,000 years before Peter's writing this, reaches back in Israelite history where they're in, um, in, in Egypt for 400 years. And at least part of that time is them in slavery and bondage and poverty and marginalization and worthlessness. And yet God redeemed them through those 10 plagues and then the, the, the Passover. And, um, and Moses led them out in the Exodus. And then Peter uses that word here, and I, and I think in his mind, he's thinking, hey, this my exodus is coming soon, my release from bondage, my release from poverty, my release from all those, those slavery things that, that kept me in bondage and slavery for so many years. And I love the fact that he, he's looking at his, at, his, at his death as an exodus. Uh, I'm 47 years old, so take what I say next with a grain of salt. But as I get older, <laughs> as I get older, I'm looking more and more forward to that, that, that release, that exodus. I, I realize that I've got a job to do while I'm here, while I'm here in this body, in this earth. But I'm also looking forward to the time when I get to go home and be with Jesus. And I'm done with this, this sinful body, and this sinful mind. And I'm done with this sinful world that's decaying and it's just, oh. It, it's just, it's, it's filthy, it's overwhelming to me. I, I, just, I can't handle this world. And yet, God has left me in this world for some kind of a purpose. And so i got to realize, well, I've got a job here. But I am looking forward to that exodus. I'm not sure how you think about that. A little morbid to say, I'm not sure how you think about death. What you think of it as like, ah, freedom. Exodus. Or if you're more terrified of it. For the believer in Jesus Christ, I, I don't like the, the process of life. But for the believer in Jesus Christ, he should be looking at that as like, oh, yes, an exodus, a release from slavery and bondage up into real living. If you haven't trusted in Christ, you shouldn't be looking forward to an exodus. It's not an exodus for you. It's going to be terrifying for you. But a little bit of an aside, I think that's such an interesting thing. Uh, Peter also talks about him uh, living in a tent uh, regarding his death. And um, I don't know how many of you guys are go camping. Um, I think I stopped tent camping a few years ago. We were at uh, up in the UP, and we got rained on, and our tent leaked, and I was like, ah, I'm done with tent camping. I don't do that anymore. I'll hotel camp, if that's a thing. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, that's, there we go. Yes. I've got a fantasy that we're going to get like a fifth wheel, and we're going to pull it up to the UP. We're going to look out the big windows in the fifth wheel, and there's going to be snow. And there's a fireplace in my fifth wheel, and my wife is making cinnamon rolls for me. It's a fantasy. <laughs> I just feel like I told that story a lot, so maybe this could become more, more than a fantasy for me. Anyway, um, Peter says, I'm just living in a tent. I'm just living in temporary existence right now. My exodus is coming soon. And we need to think of that as well. This life right here is just a temporary existence. It's going to be done soon. And then we get to go where permanence is. <clears throat> we get to go to heaven. 
Anyway, Peter's going to die soon. He's the one that is with Jesus from the early days of Jesus' earthly ministry. He was not just one of the 12 disciples. He was one of the inner three disciples. Um, he was given the keys of the kingdom, whatever those were. Uh, he was the one that opened up faith to the Jews on Pentecost morning. He was the one that opened up faith to Cornelius uh, in um, Acts chapter 10 and 11 there, or in 10. Um, he's the one that opened up uh, faith along with John and Philip to the Samaritans as well, the, the, the kind of half-Jew mongrel breeds. Um, he was the one that correctly identified who Jesus was. He was the one very instrumental in the early church. Uh, the Gospel of Mark is probably based on his recollections of the stories of Jesus. And yet Peter says, I'm dying soon. I'm dying soon. And whether he knew that from John 21, when Jesus took him on a walk and said, you're going to die a certain sort of way. Or whether there's some later meeting with Jesus, and, and Jesus said, hey, you're going to die in about five days. You're going to die in three months, Peter. I don't know exactly know what it was. But Jesus made it clear to Peter, because that would stir Peter's mind up to do certain things. And then Peter makes it clear to his audience, and I guess 2,000 years later to us, because that stirs up our minds to do certain things as well. So Peter, looking down the throat of, I'm dying soon, I want to remind you of things. I want to leave you a remembrance. I want you to be able to recall these things. And really, what is he talking about there? Really, he's saying, I want you to remember the truth. Remember the truth. All the things that this dying man could say on his deathbed, the thing that is, is on his mind is, I want people to remember the truth more. I want people to remember the truth better. Because if we remember the truth, that affects what happens in our lives. <clears throat> All the things he could have said, and he, he says that, what, why did you say that? What, what's so important about that? Well, it's like the basics of Christianity, right? We need to know the word of God better. We need to know the truth better. Absolutely. And Peter goes back to that, not just because he's talking to... Um, um, it has in here is um, that idea of diligence. Diligence. And this is not just in 1, 12 through 15. This is throughout the epistle. This idea of diligence. He says um, in verse 12, I won't be negligent. In verse 13, it says, I think it right to stir you up. In verse 15, I will be careful. I will make every effort. And I, I think of this as being like, forgive me this illustration, but the, the wife who circles the, the date on the calendar for their, her husband's anniversary of her, and drop a little hint, a, rest, a, a menu from a favorite restaurant, um, a flyer from a, a dinner show that she'd like to go to, something like that. And we might laugh at the, the cultural idea of the forgetful husband um, and perpetuate that. We, we don't have to do that kind of thing, because really, I'm, I'm pretty forgetful. Not that I'm going to forget I'm married to my, my wife, Denise. But I want to remember those things. And I want that, that day to come up as a very special day because I want to honor my wife. And I want to honor my love for her. And I want to honor our relationship and the years that she's put into dealing with me. Goodness gracious. <clears throat> and so if she can help me remember, that's a good thing. And Peter, in Second Peter, is helping his audience remember. I don't think Peter is thinking, well, if I don't remind them, if I don't write Second Peter, then the faith is going to be lost to the ages. I don't think he's thinking that. But he realizes, hey, remembering does stuff in people's lives. And so I want you to remember, not just things I've said, I want you to remember the truth. Remember the truth. I want you to be reminded of the truth, have a, to be able to recall the truth. And so I think it's a very powerful idea that Peter gives to us here. And so, as I'm thinking about the, the, the truths that Peter wants us to remember, I think he does specify in his epistle um, some of the things he wants us to remember. In um, those first 11 verses of chapter 1, he talks about God's provision, what God has given to us, all things that pertain to life and godliness. What an amazing promise. Uh, all things pertaining to life and godliness, um, exceeding great and precious promises. What an amazing thing. Uh, and then he also said, not only God's provision, he says, man's response. So you, you, in realize, realizing what God has given to you, you need to be diligent. You need to be energetic with this. 
You need to take what God has given to you and do something with it. So the things, when he says, hey, I want you to, um, I want you to remember the truth. What truth, Peter? Specifically the truth about God's provision for you and your responsibility with that. And I want you to remember that it matters as well. Those first 11 verses, he talks about God's provision and man's response and the fact that it matters. It matters what you do with your life, he says. So that you'll have, when you get up to heaven, you'll have a, a hero's welcome. You'll have a ticker tape parade when you get up to heaven, rather than just, oh, hey, welcome here. I think there's some leftovers in the fridge if you want some, some cold pizza. We had some, a guy that was, we had a party for earlier that you were no. He wants you to remember certain things. God's provision, man's response, and it matters. Moving on, after 12 through 15, we get into 16 through 21, and, and Peter talks more and more about the Word of God, and the Word of God being our source for our faith. And so I think he's saying in here, hey, remember God's provision, remember man's response, remember that it matters, and remember that the Word of God is our source. Remember the Word of God is our source, and honestly, if you look at 1 Peter and 2 Peter, there is so much about bibliology in there, which is it's kind of amazing to me, this unlearned fisherman. You know, he's got a really fully developed idea about, about the Bible, where it's from, the value of it, what it does in our lives. It's, it's really amazing. But in 1, 16 through 21, he talks about the Word of God being our source. And I want, to rem- I want you to remember the truth, the truth about the Word of God is our source. He goes on, chapter 2 is all about the false teachers. False teachers that will capture. Not just that false teachers will try to capture you. No, it's not that. It's false teachers will capture people. They will capture people. And if if you're there, if you're unguarded, if you fall from your own stability, that's where they're going to strike there. They've gone to the gym. They've worked out their abilities to capture people. And they're venting those towards you. Remember the truth as a defense against those false teachers. As I'm leaving, as my influence, Paul's influence is is gone from the church, as uh, as the, the old thing, the old church is leaving, as the new church is beginning without the influence of me and Paul, what do I want you to do? I want you to remember things. And we also are looking down the barrel of, hey, there's a new year coming. What is it that we're supposed to remember of the faith? After Peter talks in um, chapter 2 about the false teachers that will capture, in chapter 3 he talks about, um, uh, again, a couple of remind- more reminders to remember the truth. And then he says, and mockers will come mocking. And then, hey, you should live differently. So in this letter on his deathbed, as he is his last will and testament to the church. He's wanting to remind them of certain things. And really the big idea in, in, in his message in 2 Peter is, I want you to remember the truth. Remember the truth, because that's going to affect what you do with your life. That's going to affect how you live your life. That's going to affect other people's lives as well. But I want you to remember the truth. <clears throat> And, and honestly, I think this is a very similar message that um, the Apostle Paul gives in the book of Colossians. As Paul is writing to Colossians, he's writing to a group of people that have never seen him before. And um, to a group of people that um, uh, their pastor, Epaphras, travels all the way to find Paul in Rome. And tells him, hey, there's a group of, of, of believers in the, the sticks of Asia Minor. They're forgotten about by the world, but they're vibrant. They're living for the Lord. And, um, and, and But they've got some problems, Paul. What can you tell us about these problems? And Paul, in the book of Colossians, is addressing a group of people that are thinking about adding something else to their Christianity. Oh, Jesus is good as far as he goes. We need something else as well. We need something else. And Paul, in the opening eight verses of Colossians 1, he reminds them of the truth. Hey, what has been fruitful in your lives, Colossians? Has it not been the gospel, the truth that has come into your life and has borne fruit, and you're the fruit? And everywhere this gospel goes, to Colossae, to Thessalonica, to, uh, to, to, to far eastern parts of the Roman Empire, everywhere it goes, it bears fruit, and you are the fruit. 
uh, the rest of the epistle is Paul saying, so stick with that fruit. Stick with what has been fruitful in your past. Don't go off into something else. And so I think Paul's message in Colossians 1, 1 through 8, book of Colossians, but I think 2 Peter's message uh, are, are the same thing. Hey, you need to remember the truth. What's going to be fruitful for you in the future? I want my 2018 to be uh, to fruit, be fruitful, to have to, to be flourishing, uh, to have something worthwhile. And what is it that's going to do that for me? It'd be me remembering the truth. <clears throat> Seems kind of a basic message, Peter. Thanks, gosh, give us something really deep. Solve the problem of evil for us. Solve the problem of free will and God's sovereignty. Come on, give us something deep. This is deep. Remember the truth, he says. And I'm not sure how that's going to look like for me. That's been the thing that's been resonating in my mind all this last year. Second Peter has been resonating in there, and um, I, I realize that uh, the grace and peace are poured into my life as I get to know Jesus more. And then how do I get to know Jesus more? Well, it's through the Bible. It's through remembering the truth better. And so, Chris, what are you going to do in this coming year? I remember uh, uh, around January, this, this last year, 2017, I was really challenged to read a lot more of the prophets. Uh, who opens the prophets? That's a little odd. I don't really, I rarely read those things, but I really got into those things. I read Jeremiah a number of times. I read Isaiah, Ezekiel, the minor prophets. Um, I read those things, and they were very interesting to me because I, I rarely read them. And so it was very interesting for me to read that and to realize, wow, God was ministering grace and peace into my life through reading something obscure that I don't normally pay attention to. I don't know what that's going to look like for me this next year. Peter's message to me would be, hey, remember the truth, Chris. Okay, what, what should I remember about the truth? I just need to just get into the Word. I've been really challenged in the last few days to, to read the book of Proverbs, which is, again, just so confusing to me. Like this, this stream of consciousness of ideas. Hey, do this and don't do that. And do this, don't do that. But maybe God is communicating, hey, really focus on the book of Proverbs. Hey, really focus on the book of Psalms. Hey, read Revelation over and over again. Hey, read the Gospels over and over again, Chris. I don't know. I don't know what it's going to look like for me. But I know that Peter's exhortation to me, to the audience, is looking down the barrel of something new is coming. His exhortation is, remember the truth. I know that God's exhortation to me, hey Chris, you don't need something new and crazy and different. You need to remember the truth. Go back to the basics. And so I don't know what that's going to look like for me. I don't know what that's going to look like for you either. Maybe that's you deciding, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to read through the Bible in a year. I'm going to get one of those plans, I'm going to read through the Bible in a year. Even the books that I don't know anything about. Song of Solomon and Habakkuk, is that a book? I don't know. Maybe that's you reading through the Bible in here. Maybe that's you deciding to read through the book of Proverbs one a day, one chapter a day, every month for the whole year. Uh, maybe that is you deciding, I'm going to read two books of, or two chapters of the, of the Psalms every day. Maybe that's you deciding, you know, I'm going to tackle that, that really difficult problem uh, that, that this culture has for Christianity. I'm going to try to look into that one. Maybe that's you deciding, hey, I'm going to commit to that Bible study. Um, that's really going to help me grow. I'm going to start reading that book that I've been laying aside not wanting to, to tackle for a few years. I don't know what that's going to look like for you. But I know that as, as you're thinking that tomorrow is 2018, which is surreal to me. 2018, that's like science fiction stuff, I think. That's like future. That's like so close to 2020. That's like, I... That's weird. <clears throat> God would say, hey, you know what? You need to remember the truth. I think there's a conscious choice in that rather than just letting things happen. I've got very many 1980s pop songs stuck in my head. If you started singing a song by Kaja Gugu, Flock of Seagulls, Duran Duran, I'd be right there. I'd finish the song for you. I'd tell you what album it's from. I'd tell you what year it's from. You don't need to challenge me on this, okay? <laughs> Lots of useless information. I wish that stuff wasn't there. I think it's going to take a conscious choice for me to get into the Word and to remember the truth so that my 2018 is fruitful and useful. It was very challenging even by Sean being in the service. Before the service, we were talking, and he was talking about um, trying to 
church is looking down the barrel and are we thinking like the, the, the best is, is yet to come for us. Uh, is uh, the, the best years are, uh, are, are ahead of us for a church, for an individual. <clears throat> and that's going to be an idea that's going to resonate in my mind for at least a few weeks, Sean. Hopefully more than that. I'm sure I'll be able to tell you in December. That's been resonating with me for, for this whole year. Um, but how is that going to be the case? It's going to be the case if I if I get into the Word, if I let the Word get into me and, and work its way through me and apply that in my mind. My life. And so the Apostle Peter told the church to remember the truth. I'm dying. I want you to remember the truth. And I think the Apostle Peter would tell me the same thing. Chris, you're going to be dying soon. It might be 30 or 40 years. But you're going to be dying soon. So what you need to do to be flourishing and fruitful, you need to remember the truth. That's what's going to be. That's what has been fruitful in your past. That's what's going to be fruitful in your future as well. And so the Apostle Peter and God Himself, I think, would tell you this morning as you're looking at 2018 starting tomorrow, what's going to make it fruitful? You remembering the truth. Can I go ahead and close in a prayer? Father, I thank you that you are that God that's powerful and works on our behalf and that challenges us and changes us. I pray that as we are at the new year that we'd be able to look back and see how gracious and generous you've been, how much you've changed us, um, and how it's been through your word. And I pray that you'd help us to be excited about the future, excited about what you're going to do in the future, excited about your activity through us. Thank you for the privilege of being here. I pray that you would work through uh, Pathways Church here, Father God, to glorify your name here in this immediate community and then Jackson and all around the world as well, Father God. I pray that you work through the other churches here in town and around the world. And um, you've left us here for a while, and I pray that while we're here, we would do that job that you've got us to do and be faithful to you. Thank you, you love us. In Jesus' name, Father God, amen. Mm-hmm. I think our ushers had already had it out to grab the baskets, but we're going to go ahead and take the offering. Um, <clears throat> remembering the truth, remembering God's promises, remembering um, who He is and who we are to Him. Uh, it's a pretty big deal. And uh, it, it's funny how it fits with the, the last two songs that we have. Um, in your hymnal, we're going to be singing uh, 321 um, when, when you have a chance. Uh, but uh, we're just going to go ahead and pray for the offering real quick, and then, uh, then we'll go ahead and get into this. Uh, Father God, thank you so much for all that you do, uh, for the the gifts that you give us, and for our ability to uh, to be faithful with what you've given us and give back. Uh, we're just grateful for all of your promises and for your truth. Um, I'm thankful for the prayers of this con- congregation. Um, thankful for you being the rock in our lives. And so I just the opportunity that we have to give back to you it means a lot to me. So I just want to thank you for the I pray that you be with our, our tithes and our offerings. I just pray that your name be lifted up here. And that we need to honor you. And to your son Jesus and our prayer. Yeah. And three twenty eight, we'll go ahead and get it in the
God, we thank you so much for all that you do in our lives. We thank you for your promises. I just pray that you would be on our minds, that we would remember. Remember who you are, your promises, and what chasing after you looks like in our lives. 